Hey everybody, welcome back to the Badgerland Birding Podcast, bringing you birding news and stories from the Badger State and beyond. Today we're with Max Carroll, a birder and a field tech currently working for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on the beach nesting bird crew in New Jersey. Max, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you guys? Doing well. We actually, uh, we got to do something really cool this morning. We got to see the prairie chickens lecking. Oh, wow. The, um, the greater or lesser? Prairie greater. Chicken? The graders okay. got the blind treatment and everything. We were just chilling in a blind at like 4 a.m. And then they started booming. And then as soon as the light came up, we got to see them do their dance and fight each other. And it was quite the thing. That's I have so more cool. questions than answers now. <laughs> yeah. So what, what, uh, what was that? That's not in Wisconsin, is it? Or yeah. It is in Wisconsin, actually. Oh, we have a wow, okay. prairie chicken population in Buena Vista grasslands area in the central part of the state. And I think it's the only place where they really live in the state. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, kind of similar to how you guys said you don't know much about Vermont birding. I've I've got no clue about what's going on in Wisconsin bird Ooh, wise, so. You're missing out. We'll have to do a foreign exchange program with you, I think. <laughs> yeah, someday I'll get over there. I gotta fill in that eBird map, you know. You can't have that big empty blank space. That That's what happen. Derek has with what state is it? Georgia? Yeah, Georgia randomly. Everything is filled in around Georgia, oh, and Georgia's just there. There's some great birding in Georgia. Yeah, it's not you for like lack of not. <laughs> it's not that I don't want to go there. It's just I feel like I'm always around it. We've been to Savannah, Ryan, so I feel like it should have something. You could on make it, a but... retroactive eBird checklist if you remember anything. It just you feels saw. dirty. Actually, you know? I have photos from some things we saw in Georgia All on right, my Flickr account. There was definitely happen. a black vulture and some bow tail grackles. So there boom, you're go. good to go. All right. Retroactive Sounds eBird good. checklist. Problem solved. Uh, so Max, we actually met you when you were, you know, doing some work out there with the beach nesting bird stuff. Can you give us a little bit about one, how you got into birding and then how you ended up where you are now? Yeah. So um, I have a degree in wildlife biology from the University of Vermont. Um, and I kind of always going back as far as I can remember, I was interested in wildlife, but for me, it was mostly um, herps at the beginning, you know, uh, reptiles and amphibians. I always, to be honest, I always thought birds were kind of dumb. Um, and then I went to college and my freshman year. Educated himself. Some, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there were weird issues with like scheduling for classes. And I ended up in this position where the only class I could take to fill my schedule was ornithology, which was usually reserved for like sophomores and juniors. So my advisor um, managed to sneak me into the class. And, you know, I took the lecture portion of it. And I was like, okay, yeah, this is this is kind of neat. But then it was really the field ornithology portion, which is uh, two weeks just birding blitz all up and down Vermont in the summer. And I got completely hooked. Um, I you know, and then I found out about eBird. And to me, that just like the getting to look at all that data, record my sightings, that just made it, you know, even more interesting for me. And yeah, from there, I kind of never looked back. I've been doing, you know, field tech work for, I guess, like three years now. Um, I started out just kind of working on some university related projects in Vermont. I did point counts up in the boreal forest. I worked on uh, study with bobolinks and savannah sparrows, uh, which are not doing great in Vermont. Um, but I did some banding, some nest searching with them. And then I moved on to kind of the world of beach nesting birds and plover monitoring. Um, I worked on Cape Cod the past two summers, uh, doing stuff with plovers there. And I don't know if people know this, but in Cape Cod, people are really into driving their cars on the beach. Um, so they kind of need to hire a lot of people to sort of just be like little pipe, piping plover crossing guards, essentially. Um, so I did a lot of that and that kind of made me realize like, okay, I shorebirds are really, really my thing. So, um, did a little bit of a detour in, in Texas, banding golden cheeked warblers, which was great, but I ended up, yeah, back with shorebirds now I'm in New Jersey and Cape May, um, which is a nice difference from Cape Cod because in Cape Cod, really, you've just got your piping plovers. If you're lucky, you'll get an oyster catcher pair nesting, um, and then you'll get like least turns. But here in Cape May, we got skimmers. We have nesting royal turns for the first time in a while. Tons of oyster catchers, common turns. So there's 
a bigger diversity of species to work with, which I'm definitely enjoying. Yeah, before we started, you mentioned a cool American oyster catcher that you guys found. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? Yeah, um, so we have a bird that is 19 years old. Uh, it's been coming, well, I shouldn't say coming back. It actually winters here in New Jersey too. So it's been at the same site for a really long time. It was banded as a chick in 2005. And uh, he's got a little peg leg, a little stump, where he's, he's, we don't really know why, but he's missing a foot. And uh, I just found his nest yesterday. So he's one of our like little kind of celebrity birds here that everyone can always ID him just with a quick look, see that peg leg. And um, it's really funny to look at his tracks because, you know, instead of two feet, you can see the one foot and then he's got a little just kind of stump in the sand. So he's a he's a funny bird to to get to monitor. What do you think happened to him? I mean, we do so we have some birds that unfortunately end up with like fishing line tangled around their leg. We actually have one that we've been trying to catch that has that uh we've been trying to catch it to kind of untangle it for a while now. And even though the bird has a nest, for whatever reason, it's just not interested in defending that nest when we go in to try to catch the bird. So it could have been something like that, um, where it just got tangled so tight that the foot kind of just like desiccated and fell off. He could have survived, you know, an attack from an angry peregrine or something, um, but no one's really sure. Yeah, His legend Prop will only grow. Yeah, props yeah. to him for surviving. Uh, according to Cornell, the oldest one they have on file was at least 23 years, 10 months old. So if he, you know, hangs around for a couple more years, he could break the longevity record. Yeah, awesome. no, it's, it's, that would be definitely something really cool to see. Um, Throw yeah. a little party for him, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he, I, I think he should, I think he should have like a real official name. Um, he just, his name is J1, which is the code on his band. Um, I know there's like kind of a, pretty raging debate going on about and you know whether you should name the birds you're studying I, I think it's fun you know and I've met people who have said like oh if you name the birds you're studying that's it's bad luck they're all gonna die but mm. the person who said that um had really horrendous luck on their study and most of their birds died um and that's not been my experience when naming birds so I think it's just a fun thing to do. It's good for public relations too, especially when you're on the management side of things. And a lot of my job currently is kind of talking to people on the beach, explaining, hey, this is why you can't have your dog here. We have these endangered birds. You know, this is why you can't be driving here. Um, and it helps if the bird has a name and a personality and you can kind of really humanize it almost that kind of helps get the point across to people so yeah i think names are good i want to throw one out there captain barbosa because if you've seen all the pirates of the caribbean movies he ends up with a peg leg yeah that's Spoilers. definitely a contender <laughs> <laughs> now you were gonna get around to watching all the pirates of the caribbean movies that you just neglected to watch this whole I've time i've probably there. seen them so apparently I looked up famous peg leg pirates because, you know, this is where the podcast is headed. But apparently <laughs> there was a famous one known as Jambe de Bois, which means peg leg in French, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, so he's okay. credited as the first pirate in the modern era to have a peg leg. So, wow. I mean, first oyster catch, you could do, would it be Oiseau de Bois? Would that be like bird leg i don't well, know you can Jean finagle Ball it is leg so you if you're missing that i don't know what you end up with <laughs> yeah but anyway yeah, i mean you'd I, find I, some french name for him part of our uh you know kind of our way to get people to like the birds is to convince them that you know the birds are i'm kind of stealing this from the new york plover project a bit but um trying to convince them that you know they're all the birds are locals too so the bird has a French name. I don't know if we can get the point across that it's a local. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. What's a this very, isn't like uh, Quebec. What's a very New yeah. Jersey name? They could like, oh, it's Frankie. Frankie's yeah. over there. You, Frank, can't, yeah. you can't go over exactly. there. Frankie, the, the one-legged oyster catcher. Yeah, <laughs> Frankie or Vinny, something like that. Yeah. Oh, Vinny. I like Vinny. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I feel like I'm pro-name. I mean, look at how people attach themselves to Flacco. The Eurasian, you know, the Eurasian yeah, but eagle owl. Look what happened. Yeah. I know, but I'm just saying, like, think of how many 
people that was probably the spark bird for. They went to Central Park. They're like, oh my gosh, it's Flacco. Maybe I should get into birds, like that kind of stuff. I want to name some more of those things. Yeah, yeah that was know. definitely... Um, I had a lot of conflicted feelings about that bird because, I mean, obviously it was very sad that, that he died, but I think that just from his like one year out there he probably got a lot of people interested in birding and interested in conservation despite not even being a native species but i think you could definitely say a lot of a lot of good came out of it yeah it was just kind of predictable how people were like he needs to be free what could go wrong and people like he's gonna get killed by something and then he did and people like how could this have happened and it's like if you look at what goes on in new york the city there's tons of windows to fly into there's tons of probably poisoned vermin to eat so it was kind of a inevitable conclusion i think but i do want to get back to some hard-hitting questions like what is your all-time favorite shorebird you know it's kind of like uh, as a birder you know of course you always get the question what's your favorite bird so my we know you're just trying to answer, bide your time yeah no i usually just say like shorebirds in general um god if i had to i feel like i'm supposed to say pipe and clover because i've worked with them so hey, much you don't have to yeah, I I might go Wimbrel. Oh, I just curveball. Every time I see them, I just I don't know. I I think they're. I mean, they're just an incredible looking bird. Um, I have really like fond memories of. This is they're kind of one that in in Vermont they're a huge deal to get a Wimbrel. Um, so like starting out birding you know now you, you cape may cape cod you can see flocks of like 40 50 of them, no problem but just getting that like one wimbrel that would show up every year in vermont was always like a really special moment for me so i i wimbrel's definitely up there although i'm, I'm neglecting to give a 100 percent confirmation on that on that answer you want to leave a little wiggle room in case at some point exactly. purple sandpiper takes over Purple Sam, that is mm, mm, that is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> What's yeah. your least favorite shorebird? Least, oh god, that seems so. I don't know. Can I say like kill deer? <laughs> sure, that's fair. Sure, yeah, you can say whatever you want to say. Derek, what's your least yeah. favorite shorebird? Um, hmm, maybe Baird Sandpiper. I, I think feel like that's one that gets misidentified a lot, and that kind of is frustrating because I feel like I shorebirds where it's like, yeah, gotta look at the leg color is always tough, and then they get mud on their legs. It just causes a lot of like problems. Yeah, I do. I have a soft spot for Baird Sandpiper um, because I I recently did a birding trip to Ecuador, and that was like a bird that I saw there up in the Andes Mountains, and I was like. What is what is this doing? <laughs> and it was so funny because my guide, who was great and really knowledgeable, didn't know what it was. He was like forgetting the name, and I was like, "Oh, well, I know that one. I could tell you what that is." <laughs> so I've kind of I kind of have a soft spot for them. That's Did funny. it kind of feel like uh, being somewhere way out of your hometown and meeting someone from there that you'd never met before? Like you're on a trip halfway yeah. across the country, and they're just like, "Hey, don't you live in Vermont?" And you're like, "Whoa." Yeah, no, it was definitely like that, yeah. That kind of reminds me in Costa Rica, you know, um, I went with like a school group and we had a guide and, you know, he was showing us all this cool stuff. And then in uh, like one of the areas, he got a lifer and it was a yellow-bellied sapsucker. <laughs> and I was just like, yep, that's that's a yellow-bellied sapsucker. Like, well, that's like congrats. the British people. They go nuts for red-winged blackbird over there. Any of the warblers that we have causes chaos. It's all relative. It is all relative. It's the um, beauty of birding. It's driven by rarities. Yeah. yeah. So, Max, tell us more about what birding in Vermont is like, because that's a place that I just, I have no idea what the scene is like there, you know, what you can really expect to find or anything like that. So give us the, like, full lowdown about the birding scene there. And is it better than New Hampshire? Oh, come on. Yeah, of course it's better than New Hampshire. I mean, look, New Hampshire has that, like, 10 miles of coast so obviously they have a much higher species list than vermont i think it, if you go on ebird i think vermont is either the like second to last or third to last state in terms of species so i know you're really I'm, selling it max oh uh, yeah i'm facing an uphill task to convince people it's like it's big like, years in the state super easy there's 
15 species <laughs> to find max yeah um but i think kind of going off what we were just saying about how you know it's all relative with like rarity and everything i find that that is like something that really draws me to vermont birding is that it's way easier to get excited i think about birds in vermont because so many of them are rare like what we we're just talking about with wimbrels i like for my first four years of being a birder i was in vermont and every year you know you get so excited to find like that one like you know i don't know american golden plover that's going to show up on the lake um we have a big like it's called lake champlain it runs kind of like down the border between new york and vermont and it's a great spot for shorebirds but every year you know you you'd be like okay where's that that one spot where i can find like a nice group of like northern shovelers and shovelers were like such a like crazy thing to get excited about and then you know i go to i lived in texas for a bit and it's like oh down the street there's 600 <laughs> shovelers um which i guess it depends on how you look at it like obviously that's very cool but to me like I, I enjoy when birding feels like really exciting. And to me, Vermont gives like such a feeling of excitement when you find those birds because they're just, they're not that common there. And it, it makes it a lot more like, it, it makes you get excited about, about birds that in other states you probably wouldn't even take another look at. It's what I think is one of the best things about birding in Vermont. Was that Lake Champlain as in Champ, like where the sea monster sightings are that's the same one <laughs> yes yeah what's the yeah. deal with that is that real is that fake uh, i is it more rare than a know. shoveler <laughs> yeah i i have not um i don't personally have any sightings recorded of uh of champ but um there are people who will tell you it's real definitely ryan you're like it's uh probably more rare than a shoveler it probably is a northern shoveler it could be. It could be a loon. <laughs> could be a grebe. Uh, does Vermont have any specialty species? So are there any things that, like, if you want it, go to Vermont and you'll get it? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think one big one would be Bicknell's thrush. Oh, um, that's a good one. Yeah, I was definitely, I didn't realize how spoiled I was when I lived there with Bicknell's thrush. We have a couple um, pretty tall mountains. We have Mount Mansfield and Camel's Hump. And if you go up there in june july and climb to the top it's a really nice hike and you'll be just surrounded on all sides by bicknell's thrush um you know singing you can see them uh and there's a lot of work done conservation wise with them in vermont um there's a we have a like a local like um nonprofit called the vermont center for eco studies that they will ban Bicknell's thrush, put transmitters on them, and then they actually go down to their wintering grounds. I, I'm i blanking. I think it's either, it's like the Dominican Republic or somewhere in, it's somewhere in the Caribbean, and they'll actually go and, like, retrieve those, like, same birds that they banded mm -hmm. in Vermont. Um, so Vermont's definitely a great Bicknell's thrush place, and we also have yellow-bellied flycatcher breeding on those same That's mountains. Cool. So that's definitely one that I would say is a highlight of Vermont. And then probably the biggest draw, I think the reason that most people would come to Vermont would be for the boreal species. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times I'll be like exploring people's profiles on eBird because I'm curious, like the, you know, the, some of the biggest birders in the US, like what have they done in Vermont? And I'll click on it and either it's blank or it'll be Brutal. only a visit up in the top kind of Northeast corner we call it the Northeast Kingdom in Vermont. And you can get spruce grouse, black-backed woodpecker, boreal chickadee, and Canada jay up there. Um, and if you get all four in one day, we call it the boreal grand slam. I don't oh, know I if like that's it. just a Vermont thing. or, if, um, But they're really reliable. Like spruce grouse, there's just this one trail at this spot called Moose Bog where if you spend enough time walking that trail throughout the day, like I can guarantee you, you you will see a spruce grouse. And wow, a guarantee. Guarantee spruce are grouse guarantee. Rare. You can hold me to that. Um, but and it's 
if you go in, you know, June, July, it's a great time to see the spruce grouse with their chicks, which, you know, is something that a lot of a lot of photographers really love that. Um, and that same spot is great for the jay and the woodpecker too. The boreal chickadee has become a little bit trickier to find in recent times. Sometimes you have to go off the beaten path a little bit more for that one, kind of get into sort of the, the bogs a bit, um, which can get pretty pretty buggy during certain times of the year. Um, but yeah, definitely boreal species are a highlight for Vermont. That's pretty cool. I heard Maine used to be a really good spruce grouse place, but somebody told me that recently it's been a little tougher to find them there, which is kind of a bummer. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're kind of in decline everywhere, unfortunately. Um, but I'm not I'm not too familiar with with birding up in Maine. My one my my primary Maine birding expedition left a very bad taste in my mouth. So oh, I haven't done that much. I was uh it was when I was going to school in Vermont and there was a red wing uh in some park in Portland and it had been there for like close to a month. And a friend and I one day we were just like, all right, it's four hours, but like this bird it's clearly staying here so let's just go and we waited around there all day and the you know the red wing obviously wasn't there and we left and then it was back the next day and was oh. there for like another two weeks afterwards so after that I took like a serious hiatus from any um long distance chases which I now regret because that's what prevented me from going after the stellar sea eagle which was also oh. And now I regret that one um, quite a lot. I thought you were going to say that event made me take a really close look at my life and reevaluate some things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, not not quite. I mean, just just made me reevaluate the uh, the long distance bird chases, which I actually attempted my other a, a new long distance chase recently, which was also a failure. So I'm going to have to go into long distance chase hibernation again for a while now <laughs> which one was the most recent one uh it was a rough in connecticut um oh. been there for a few days and i was getting pretty pretty desperate for a rough i had missed a few ones here in new jersey so i just decided to go for my weekend meet up with a friend there and no luck but um that was the day i, I did get that thick build myrrh in uh, new jersey on my way oh, back nice. so yeah. that was very recently then yeah, yeah, that was pretty shortly before I ran into you guys, yeah. Oh, nice. What's um, interesting about birding up there is that your states are so little compared to where we live, so that you can go cross state lines so easily. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, in four hours I was in Maine, and then I've been Connecticut. Here, it's like you could go six hours and still be in the same state. Yeah, I mean, it definitely, it's it's great for just kind of like filling in those those states, you know, to get to get species in, in different states. Um, but I mean, that that is why, you know, like we have less diversity in like the states up in New England. I mean, when I was working in Texas, I mean, you could drive 10, 12 hours and still be in the same state. And that was like I I birded in Vermont for four years and ended up with like really intensely birding. And I ended up with 272 species and I lived in Texas for four months and ended up with 279. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah so texas is i mean i'm not here to talk about texas but yeah that was that was crazy um uh big nels thrush by the way wintering ground dominican republic it looks like hey okay. you were right yeah. there you go that's what i thought yeah the trust level is rising <laughs> that guarantee but, um, is looking a little more sure for oh no i that's an ironclad guarantee you will oh get he's up in it he's up in the ante moose bog and you know what the thing is even if you don't get it Moose Bog is a really great spot because it's one Hold of those up, areas. Wait, yeah, you can't even, say even if you don't get it. It's an get ironclad it, it's guarantee. An ironclad. Which one is it? All right, no, I do guarantee it. But in addition to the spruce grass, it's a great spot to go and just hang out in the parking lot with some like bird seed and the red-breasted nut hatches and the chickadees will just come eat right out of your hand. Um, so that's it's always a fun spot, even for non-birders. Will yeah. the spruce grouse eat out of your hand? Unfortunately, not. Although they are pretty tame i think they're used to people walking that trail a lot taking pictures of them so they'll they'll get pretty close to you definitely they're a tricky bird to get we've only ever seen one and it was in wisconsin 
and it was up in the north woods so we kind of have a similar boreal area as you guys have but i think that our birds are less frequent up there because i don't think anybody really gets black pack woodpecker or boreal chickadee there anymore but i think they used to be pretty annual now there's like one or two reports and that's about it um but we did see a spruce grouse once and that's the only one we've ever seen well we had a, we had like three but only one like account one encounter with the yeah. spruce grouse yeah um i think that sometimes people might not think of like vermont as being one of the best boreal states but because we do have like a very small section it really is just that northeast corner but within that section there the species are pretty densely populated so it is like if you're looking in new england to get those birds that's definitely one of the, the best spots to go so would you say summer is the best time in general for people that want to go to vermont summer you can get the big nails thrush and then you can go check out the spruce grass spot uh, yes with the caveat that unless it's a, an eruption year for finches in the winter um that would be another one that i mean if it's an eruption year the finch like scene in vermont is amazing i mean i think it was 2020 was the crazy finch eruption year and you could walk down the street in burlington and just couldn't walk 20 feet without seeing a giant flock of you know pine gross beaks feeding on all the, the crab apples like and i haven't seen one since then uh -huh. I didn't realize, like, you know, how lucky it was for that year to be such a good eruption year. Um, but yeah, I mean, Bohemian wax wings, easy to get in Vermont. Um, red crossbills, even if it's not an eruption year, we've had some red crossbills that we think might be breeding um, in some of the forests in Vermont. Um, so yeah, finch season is definitely great, great time to to bird to bird there. Yeah. What would you say are like the top hotspots? So say we visited Vermont let's do three like what are the three places that we need to go to moose moose bog was it moose bog i'm assuming yeah. that's one of them absolutely um my personal favorite is a spot called delta park um it's a little kind of like sort of you know marshy kind of mud flat area on the shore of lake champlain and it's a great spot for shorebirds in the fall um, like I was kind of saying earlier, like shorebird migration in Vermont is, you know, we get a lot of like least sandpipers, semi-palmated plovers, kind of all the, the basic stuff there's a lot of. But then if you consistently like go to Delta Park throughout that season, you're going to get some some wacky birds like, you know, we've had um, redneck fowler ups that show up there, a lot of buff breasted sandpipers some years. Um, and it's just a really fun kind of just like gamble of showing up there in the morning and like knowing that, okay, there's going to be like at least one wacky shorebird here, like wacky from Vermont. And uh, that's why I love that spot so much. You just kind of never know what you're going to get, you know? It's got mm -hmm. a nice boardwalk too for warblers, really great in the spring for that. Um, that's probably, it's probably going to sound crazy, but it's my favorite birding spot like anywhere that I've been. Um, and yeah, I think it's definitely worth checking out if you're visiting Vermont, definitely in the fall and spring. Um, and then another one that I would say is good, good for the fall is um, Missiscoy National Wildlife Refuge. So that's uh, along the lake in the um, northwestern corner of Vermont. And that spot is like the best spot for, you know, finding wacky shorebirds. Like you have to be able to get a kayak to go out in the mud flats, so it's really underbirded. But when people do bird there, people find the most insane things. Um, so that's why I think like if people just started birding it more, we could get a lot more species on the Vermont list of shorebirds. Um, that's where two friends and I, um, two great birders, who I'll shout out, uh, Chris Liazos and Jacob Crawford. We went out there in our kayaks a few years ago and found the first ever common ringed plover for Vermont. Ooh, that's awesome. Um, and that was such an intense process because it was in a flock of like 25 semi palms. And we sat there for like two hours taking pictures of it from every possible angle, getting audio recording. We were on like 
you know, European Facebook birding groups, like arguing with French people about like, you know, <laughs> is this a common ring plover or not? Um, but after like a really, after a while, it did get accepted by like the bird records committee in Vermont. Um, wow. So I just, I always think that like, we don't know how much stuff is out there, but people like that at that spot, but people just aren't birding it enough because it's not so accessible. Um, and another spot I'll shout out would be um, Colchester Pond, uh, which is in Chittenden County, kind of near Burlington. And we have a population of breeding golden wing warblers there. Oh, nice. And that's, it's really fun because there's plenty of hybrids mixed in. And every year you've got to go through and take pictures of the birds and like analyze them you know like okay is there any little speck of yellow on the breast here like is that one solid wing bar like it's kind of like a fun like little project to figure out which which of the birds there are you know considered like pure golden wing warblers which ones are hybrids um and that spot also is just probably the best warbler spot in general in vermont um you look a pure golden wing warbler should be called a 24 carat <laughs> like that is a 24 karat golden wing warbler yeah no I, that's <laughs> i think um it's interesting too i i've met some some people who like are really serious about you know making sure the bird that you see is pure like i've had pictures of birds where i thought it was you know i've celebrated like yes i got my my golden wing warbler for the year and then you zoom in and you see that there's like one a little yellow breast feather and there are people who'll be like no it doesn't count um and then i know other you know respected birders who think the whole thing is goofy and that they should just mush them into one species anyway you know um so i don't really know where i stand on that but i think it's pretty interesting i think it's Sounds... wild that they have two hybrids so you know it's not just you have a hybrid so you have the lawrences and then you have yeah. is the brewsters i think is the other one so it's like what's up with that you get two hybrids out of the same two species that's just weird sounds very similar yeah. to the tropical northern perula and south texas deal well is there i'm not familiar with that are they they think they might be the same species or? well so in uh south texas you get tropical perulas but it's the kind of thing where they hybridize with northern so if you have uh, something okay. that looks tropical but it has like some white in the eye then yeah. people say like oh it's a hybrid you can't count it sometimes there's like one fleck of white in the eye and people say <laughs> you can't do it and so some people think they're all hybrids some think you know that it's all fine you can just count it so it's it's the the very similar thing yeah it it kind of um it's it's definitely uh, a matter of like how much you're into the semantics of it. I mean, I, I think that it seems like only a matter of time before they get lumped together. I mean, I, I think I've I've read that they share like ninety eight percent of the same DNA, ninety nine or something like that. Um, oddly enough, we don't have the Lawrence's warblers in Vermont. Like I've only ever seen the Brewsters. In terms of the hybrids, I think it would be like really rare to get a Lawrence's in Vermont. That's so strange. Yeah. We're going to have to talk to a geneticist about this. I feel like there's other stuff that should actually be split too. I was talking to someone recently about the juncos. You know, the Oregon juncos look drastically <laughs> different than the slate colored juncos. And then there's stuff like the Audubon's yellow rumped warbler versus the myrtle and the mangrove warbler versus the yellow warbler. So I feel like I'm always in favor of a good split. Not so much in favor of the lumping. I always like the splits more. What about the uh, Western flycatcher lump? I think split them back. <laughs> I like I like not being able to identify it unless you hear it. That's a good thing for everybody. Yeah, I think that um, obviously, like the benefit, well, the one benefit of a split is you know, in some cases, you get those armchair lifers, you know, where you get to add them to your list without having to go out and chase them down. But I think more importantly, like splits are great for conservation, you know, like a lot of times it's harder to like designate that a species needs protection if, you know, you've got one species where it's doing fine in one half of the country and then not doing well in the other half of the country. If you can then say like, okay, this population over here is a distinct species, it can be easier to get like funding for, for conservation efforts. That's sneaky. I like it. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I would be totally in favor of like just using taxonomy as a trick to get <laughs> conservation funding, you know. Um, <laughs> you split Western and Eastern bald eagle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. As a shorebird guy, are you in favor of the eastern western willet split? I, you know, I'm I'm probably not the best person to ask, but based on people I know who know a lot more than I do, I I've it seems like the answer would be yes. Like, I mean, that they're they're different enough, like, and they're I think their their migration routes are you know completely different. So I I would say that. That would definitely be uh, something worth splitting. Yeah, I feel like we should get shirts that say "split them" and then just have you know some picture of a bird that needs to be split, like mangrove warbler. Just boom, split them. We can form like a little club. Yeah, I'd, I'd be down. <laughs> You'd have there to make is. a lump them shirt though, too. No, no one wants to lump them. Well, you gotta uh, you gotta have both options available. Would there be like dance battles between the split them gang and the lump them gang? Yeah, it's like you're birding and you have like a split them shirt and you run into someone with a lump them shirt. You just lock you eyes get... <laughs> from across the park. You're just like stuff's about to go down. <laughs> yeah. Max, do you well, besides the rough, do you have a nemesis bird currently? I do, yeah. Um I've got a few, but probably the biggest one would be um, American goshawk. Um, oh, yeah. That's a bird that I, I don't know how I lived in Vermont for four years and didn't see a goshawk because they're it's a pretty good state to get goshawk. Um, I I knew some guys who went out to a nest one time and I I didn't go along and the offer kind of was like never extended again and it since then it's just like hasn't i haven't really been anywhere where they'd be common um one of my a good friend of mine he's uh living in new hampshire right now going to grad school and he's like doing some research with like putting up um aru's at goss talk nest sites and he'll like send me pictures from from the sites of like you know piles of feathers from like that the goshawk, you know, just had a meal. He'll take pictures of their nests, and I'm just like, why are you teasing me so much? <laughs> the um, offer is not extended to go to New Hampshire. Or is that too much enemy territory? I I went. I visited right before I started my current job in Cape May, but that was like literally probably a week before the goshawks really started nesting, and it was easy to find them. So yeah, no luck. <laughs> He'll like see um, you on that camera. Like you'll just be there waving at him, be like, "I found the nest site." Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if I, if I, I don't know. You know, my my position here ends in kind of like the middle of August, so I don't know if it'll be too late by that point. But maybe I'll have to rush up to New Hampshire real quick and take a peek. I think it's in order for sure. Uh, what do you think is the next step for you? Are you going to do more stuff with shorebirds? Are you going to try and switch it up? Kind of what's your what's your next step? Yeah, um, I think it's it's tricky because I feel like my career in like wildlife is pretty young still. And even though I've kind of found what I like with shorebirds, I don't want to get locked in on that without getting to kind of experience different sorts of field work and try to gain other skills. So I definitely would like to get a little more experience doing passerine banding. Um, I have a bit from when I was banning the golden cheeked warblers, but you know, they're an endangered species, so there's not exactly a whole lot of them. So I don't have a huge number of uh, passerines banded on my list. Um, so I'd love to work at a banding station. Um, I would like to get some experience with telemetry. That's definitely something that I am feeling like I lack in my skill set. Um, and in terms of shorebirds, I would like to definitely do some work with some migratory species. Like I've done three seasons now with like our, you know, our plovers and oyster catchers that breed here. But I'm I'm really interested in, you know, getting to do either surveys or banding with, you know, migratory species that breed in the Arctic. Because um, honestly, some of them are, are really my favorite species. So. Yeah, Purple for sure. Piper. Um. Do you have any recommendations for younger birders that want to get into field work? Like, do you do you enjoy doing a bunch of different things, or would you rather be like solidified into one long term project? Sounds like you like having you know a little taste of everything. 
Yeah, um, I definitely think that, you know, when you're young is the time to do that, you know, like, obviously, I, I'm not going to be like 40 years old and still being a seasonal field tech, I hope. <laughs> you never um, know. But I, I think that, yeah, when you've graduated college, like, if you are fortunate enough to, like, be in a position where doing seasonal field work is feasible for you, then I think you'll regret it if you don't. Like, it's a great way to see the country, to get to, you know, and just from, from a, like, personal life point of view, you can get to bird in some incredible states and places that otherwise you'd have to spend an expensive vacation to to get to go to. And I think the reality is that when you have a career in wildlife, like, once you get a permanent position and you start working your way up the ladder, you're not in the field that much anymore, you know? so until I really, until my, my bones are weary and I can't do it anymore. I want to like be out here getting as many different experiences as I can. And I, I definitely recommend that to, you know, younger birders or, you know, younger people interested in, in conservation, like, you know, start now, start as soon as you can. Like, I think one of the problems for me that I've encountered is that since I got into it, you know, late, like not until I got into college, I I feel like I'm always going to be behind those people who were birders when they were in like middle school and high school and were able to like volunteer at banding stations then and you know by the time they graduate high school or college they've already banded like 500 birds you know and there's just like no catching up to those people at this point so I would say definitely like if you're interested get get on it as soon as possible. Yeah, I would say that starting late though you probably have a important different perspective on it too and probably more of an appreciation honestly because i feel like when you get into bird like we got into birding pretty late as well um because you know we watched the big year and we were just like oh people do this and then we started doing it and we're like this is really is, fun. is that really how you guys got into birding? yeah legitimately we, we didn't know the that movie. birding really existed we were like people pay attention to them but we didn't know there was a competitive aspect or like uh, there's sites you can go out and figure out where these birds are, stuff like that. We thought it was yeah. much more loose than that. And seeing that there was an infrastructure for it, we were just like, whoa, we need to do this immediately. Yeah, I was kind of the opposite because I had already become a birder. And then somebody was like, oh, so your favorite movie must be the big year, right? And I was like, this can't be a real thing. Like, there's no way they made a movie about <laughs> about birding with these like three really famous actors. Um, <laughs> So that's that's funny that that's what like got you into it. And yeah, did but you I... like the movie? Yeah, I actually um one of the one of the birders I knew in Vermont, um an older guy who had guided for quite a long time. He I just assumed the movie was mostly fiction, but he told me that he like knew some of those guys and that most of the events in that movie were actually true and like actually happened. Um which I had no clue, like the whole thing about the one guy having been divorced like three times or whatever, every time he did a big year, like that was oh. all true. Oh, um, I didn't know that. Yeah. It, like, I mean, those are, those are real people. It's based on, um, the, yeah, the guy that I knew, he claimed like the whole thing with like finding that like pink footed goose in that little pool on top of oh, the mountain. Wow. Like, I, I was really skeptical when I saw that, but he, he said that was like mostly true. So Interesting. I so yeah. we, the guy I think Bostic is based off of, I believe is Sandy Comedo. And then there is, they call one of the guys, the Greg real Miller. Jack Black. What was, who is it, Derek? Greg Miller. He's Greg like Miller, the, the real, real Jack Black, Jack which Black. is hilarious. Um, yeah, I guess he was real as well. And we actually encountered a guy from Illinois who told us, you know, that scene where they put, or where Bostic puts his pants as the windsock. He yeah. said that that happened, except other people put his pants up as the windsock as like a prank. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really surprised. Yeah, but it's, it's cool that, you know, some of that is based on real life. Uh, but what I was saying is I feel like once you when you get into it later, you have almost more of an enthusiasm, I feel like, because you haven't necessarily been exposed to it your whole life. So like everything's kind of new and you can attack it in a different yeah. way than someone who's kind of been doing it their whole life almost. Yeah, I definitely, um, I think about, like, I know a few people whose parents are birders and, you know, they've been, because of that, for their whole life, like, all their 
trips have been like based on birding and i think like oh i'm so jealous of that but then i realized like if if my parents were really into birding what i i probably would have thought it was lame and never wanted to do it you know um but yeah i, I know some people who have been birding since they were like really little kids and they kind of like almost run out of steam and then like switch to to bugs Moss. Um, but, that's a good yeah. point there are a lot of people that do that when they start burning early yeah it's i feel like you you like feel like you've completed you birds so soon and you're like well i need more and then obviously with insects there is infinitely more to to learn about and to identify than there is with birds so i haven't hit that point yet i don't know if i ever will um we'll see i feel like birds are such a good number to have to deal with you know because mammals and stuff there's just not that many and then yeah. insects there's way too many birds are just like that comfortable medium where there's enough to keep you going but not too many that they're always forever out of reach you kind of have yeah. to expand your circle too you know when you see a lot of your state then you kind of expand out of the state and then you can expand out of the u.s but i mean there's over ten thousand species of birds i don't think you could ever run out of things to see um yeah unless you're that like one guy who just hit like ten thousand peter kastner i mean he's yeah. not got he doesn't have all of them though yeah like how you had him ready to go right out of your pocket peter kastner there's your answer so <laughs> well, I'd, yeah i we'd love to have him on the podcast talk about his i mean i'm sure he's got tons of crazy stories about seeing oh, yeah, that many species and, and all that do you think he remembers every single one he saw or did some just slip through the cracks sometimes when you're birding in those other countries like some people, you know, it'll be a guy being like, oh, that's this, that's this, that's this. And some people will just count all of that. Other people are more meticulous, like, no, I need to see it. I need to have media of it. So I don't know enough about Peter to know like what kind of birder he is, but just seeing that many species is a pretty incredible feat. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely am kind of more on the side of like, if a guide points something out and I don't get a good look at it, like I take it off my list later. It just feels like I want to remember a bird if I see it, you know? Um, yeah. We talk a lot even, about the experience. Like, even if it's a species you've seen, you can always get a better experience. Like the prairie chickens. We've seen them before, yeah. but today was by far the coolest experience in the blind. Yeah. It's like you're seeing them with new eyes, doesn't it? Yeah. It's well, a you're life like, bird all over again. You're like, look at those weird neck tuft things that they like, <laughs> you know, move up. And then the orange air sac things. Like, that's just not something we've ever seen before. Oh, that it's close. mystified. It was cool. It's a cool thing. Yeah, I definitely um I think about like lifers that I I had such a like horrendous look the first time. And one that comes to mind is um I was birding at a, a wetlands in Vermont and um I was looking at a pair of wood ducks in my binoculars and then this like little like tiny little black bird just like shot like dancing across the water through my field of, of view in my binoculars and I never saw it again but it was a common gallinule and that was my oh, lifer yeah. and for the longest time is they're a hard bird to get in Vermont um so for the longest time that was my only look and I was like ah oh, should I even have this on my list like it felt almost like cheating to, to have it there um but I've since gotten better looks so yeah Every day it was just weighing on your conscience. You like couldn't go to sleep. You're like, should I just take it off the list? No, no, I saw it. And then the next day, I, I have to take it off my list. I mean that that's uh, yeah, that's uh, that is honestly how how it happens sometimes with, with some birds. Like some, I used when I first started birding, I I didn't even record report things that were heard only. And then somebody pointed out to me like, you know, eBirds not just for your list. It's actually like used for for data and uh, if you don't report the things you're hearing you know you're skewing the data and i was like oh yes that's that's a great point <laughs> and obviously i don't do that anymore yeah, there's some things that are just hard to see too you know like whippoorwills and night jars in general some rail species it's tough to get a look at those and if you can you know pick it out by ear i feel like that's that's different than someone just being like did you hear that and you're like maybe and they're like count it yeah yeah i um I don't have many herd only birds on my list, but one that haunts me is a Swainson's warbler that I've only heard. And I sat in front of this bush for like 20 minutes hoping this bird would come out and I could not get even the slightest look at it. 
Hmm. Um, and then one actually, I um, prior to taking this job, I was living in Philadelphia and um, one showed up in a park like right down the street from my house today and like 40 people saw it and I didn't, I was at work, so I didn't have the time to run over there, but that one kind of, kind of upset me to miss. You're like, I was doing some shorebird research in Philadelphia. That's what I was there for. <laughs> yeah, if, if only we had shorebirds there. Maybe back in the day, something on, could have been going on on the river, oyster catchers maybe, but definitely not anymore. We always joke that for guides, you know, do they ever build a tour around just birds they need? Like our friend Alex Lamro, yeah. you need Slady back call. And I was like, you got to just advertise, like doing a Slady back call tour. <laughs> Everybody sign up. So for your next job, you'd be like, I really need to research American goshawks. Yeah. And then after um, that's done, just move on to the next one. Yeah, that that's honest. I mean, that's not an unrealistic goal. Like there are a fair amount of jobs out there now searching for goshawks. So who knows? Maybe Maybe I will do that. Also got to point out uh, Max Carroll, number 51 on the Vermont all-time eBird Whoa, list. Whoa, so, you know, 100 all-time. Let's go, Max. I, I was number 50, and then I left. You know, I haven't lived there in two He's years He's not now. looking got, at it every day, though. Yeah. I got No, no, no. I got booted out of that top 50 since I left. But We'll have to get you back in. You'll have to show us around, and then you can pick up some state birds yourself. I mean, it's it's – it's tough. Um, you kind of, once you get to around the 250 or so range in Vermont, like you've kind of hit sort of the ceiling and everything from there, you're just waiting for the, the rarities to show up. Um, oddly enough, my, my last new species that I got in Vermont was Northern Mockingbird, um, <laughs> which had been just like evading me the entire time I lived there. And right before I was about to leave to go um, do shorebird work on Cape Cod, I was like, I'm not leaving this state without getting mockingbird. So I drove like over an hour to this one cemetery where somebody had reported one a few days earlier and I got it. And then I could leave Vermont a happy birder, finally get that mockingbird. Very good. Max, can we talk about Bennington County? That's not an area I'm super familiar with. You, you got every county filled in except that one. <laughs> it just seems kind of sketchy for a meticulous data guy like you to just leave a whole county. I love how you're unchecked. just stalking his eBird map right now, and you're just <laughs> well, like, Max let's doesn't talk about other how people, you failed so. <laughs> your state in Bennington County. Also, you're not allowed to submit another checklist because you have 500 on the dot. So I feel that, like that's that, got to stay there. I promise that that is a complete coincidence. <laughs> but <laughs> Mr. 500, <yeah>. Maxi Manhattan. <laughs> the um I will say that most Vermont birders, I don't want to like offend the southern Vermont birders, but most of the action happens in northern Vermont in the Champlain Valley, which is like Franklin County, Chittenden County, and then Addison County, which are all along Lake Champlain. That's where, you know, all your good shorebirds are going to be. That's where, you know, a lot of the, the action is on the lake. And then the other point would be the Northeast Kingdom, which is um, Essex County. So, yeah, there's there's never been anything in Bennington that's made me think like, OK, I need to drive two and a half hours from Burlington to to go down there and and fill in that county. But it'll happen someday. Trust me, I'm 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 with you that bothers me every day that that county's not filled in so well i think it's gonna this... be a rough reported or a goshawk reported down there well that's the thing is there was a rough in vermont at one of one of the spots i used to bird at all the time um which and... obviously wasn't bennington county because you've never submitted a checklist <laughs> it was I think not the bigger issue is you know this section Ooh. Here. Oh my God! What we're just putting my eBird on blast now? Is that Apparently, what this is? yes. It's wow. pu it's public data, Mag. This has never actually <laughs> happened before. We've never had to publicly roast somebody who we've I was had gonna, as a guest. I was not not expecting this at all. We got to like, I would have come up, prepared yeah. by taking a trip out to the <laughs> west if I had known. But it looks like you did some good things in the southwest. So, I yeah, I do. I have some some. Um, my grandma lives out in um southern arizona right by madeira canyon so i have a good good connection there for some birding um but yeah you know you can kind of almost just see the patterns of the road trips i've done you know i've done a yeah. road trip down to florida 
out to you know Oklahoma and Texas. Um, and then there's that weird awkward gap of Kentucky in there because the major roads don't go through Kentucky. So. No. <laughs> Derek, I think you should show us yours then. If we're gonna put him on blast, I think let's you should do show it. Um, let me pull it up real quick. We just gotta absolutely tear it apart, Max. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Well, if, if Vermont's empty, I'm already going to tear it apart just for it that. Is, it is empty. I know. Max, I fact. told you I, I know nothing about birding in Vermont. <laughs> we we went over this. All right, I'm literally see. waiting with bated breath to see this bad boy. Well, the real question is, which which one of you has more lifers in the U.S.? He definitely does. I travel a little more than Ryan does. Is there any sort of uh, rivalry going on there? You know, not, not really. really. It's kind of like when one of us gets to go somewhere cool, then we make a video about it. So it's kind of like the other yeah. one gets to experience it. So we're like, oh, I'm glad you got to see it and share it. So yeah, all right, let's good. break this thing down. Obviously, Vermont. Vermont no checklist in Georgia. Vermont. Yeah, Georgia. What's going on in Georgia, man? It's... Apparently nothing. Just never another never been. Well, I've been, but we haven't ebert it. I think you and Max need to take a trip out to that area, though. That's true, That's Max. Let's Blanco. go out to Montana, yeah. <laughs> Idaho, Wyoming. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm hoping one day I'll get a job out in Washington or Oregon. Then I'll I'll Somebody's do the road the trip door, out there. Hang on. Yeah, but uh, one thing I'll I'll plug real quick is that I noticed that along with Vermont, one of the states that I never see people have filled in is is West Virginia. And I do have some family out there. And the birding, especially for warblers there, is incredible. But it's hmm. such an underbirded state. Um, I th my, my uncle has a farm like up in the mountains in a county there. And I birded there for, you know, a few weeks. And it, that was enough to become like the top e-birder in the county because just nobody birds there at all. Um, and I, I really, that's another area that like, I really wish people would explore more. Cause I think there's definitely some like treasures hiding up in there. Yeah. I feel like once you kind of just get into a state, you can kind of just by talking to people, figure out the top places people go and like the coolest places. Like, I feel like that happened to us in New Jersey. People just give us recommendations. Like we went to Barnegat lighthouse. That was a really cool spot. spot. Yeah, yeah. And you just kind of get those insights and you can kind of figure it out. But then there are those underburdened gem areas that uh you know it could just really use more people and i'm sure there's rare stuff there that nobody ever finds or that just goes unnoticed did you um did you ever get your salt marsh sparrow you were looking we for did not we ah. so we met the guy who was eberting there like every day was it so bill he, elric yeah yeah he's very scottish I haven't met him, but I, I his reports are insane. He puts up like almost a hundred species most days. Yeah. Um, but he was saying that when the tide is high, then they have to come to the road. And so it's a lot easier to find them. Okay. And so he also told us he had some singing earlier that day, but he said they don't normally sing. But then he said, like he told us we were kind of confused. <laughs> um it was like a mix of like you got to listen to them sing but they don't really sing but you can find them here but not right now it was like a lot of that kind of stuff are you gonna do the accent or no you do i think you do the better <laughs> scottish impression than All i right. do if you're gonna find wait, 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 so much. the soul marsh sparrows you're gonna have to listen for their call but they're not going to sing right now but you can find them if you go to marker four five six and seven but not right now because they're everywhere and they're nowhere all at the same time. Yeah, that's I mean, how it that, was. Yeah, that's there. I, I go to that spot, um, Forsyth, a fair amount. And I definitely do not always get them on my list. Seaside Sparrow is a lot a lot easier to find usually. We did notice that. Yeah, I went out the other night to uh, listen for um, yellow rails. Because around here, this is like the kind of sort of the one one or two week window where they migrate through. And I did not hear a yellow rail, but I mean, there were probably like over 20 seaside sparrows, you know, singing all around me in the marsh. So it's, it's a pretty cool thing to hear. All right, here we go. Is this mine? It honestly <laughs> is not bad. No, I've got the Dakotas, which none of you guys have. Yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, not terrible. You got... You got some stuff here, here, here. Yeah, there's, there's some things that need to be sorted out, but, you know. 
Wisconsin I mean, clearly is the top for me compared to you guys, which had other things. You guys are both, I mean, not just Vermont, you're severely lacking in, in New England. New England. We're, you're telling we're me. Aware. Yeah. The best I, part is that it looks like New York is all filled in, but we just went to Central Park and that's it. <laughs> Did you go to see Flacco or? No, look <laughs> at that. <laughs> that's no, astounding. we just went, we went to Bird it, you know, get the experience. We actually saw some cool stuff. We had like Louisiana water thrush there. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. Oven bird. It was pretty cool. That I is mean, a I spectacular definitely, um, checklist right there. <laughs> if you're looking to do some, uh, some more New England birding outside of Vermont, Cape Cod, definitely another recommendation. Like probably one of the best spots to get um, shearwaters and Jaegers and all that stuff from land um, without going out on a pelagic. We want to hit every state for sure. Yeah, we, we want to make like a video going on to every avoid state. any place. I will say though, New Jersey, so many tolls. Like as someone who'd never been there, trying to navigate that whole thing, figure out what lane you're supposed to be in. And then it was like every couple miles you were on the same road and there'd be another toll. I'm like, I just yep. paid for this road. <laughs> like, why do I have to pay again? Yeah. In fact, we actually spent $131,000 on tolls. <laughs> I would believe it. <laughs> I mean, what's, I... like, what's up with that? How are people supposed to it's... like non- People not from there. Supposed He's not to even from there. That. He's from Vermont. He's not in with the city no, council. Lives there now. I'm from New Jersey. I just oh, want you to are. Never mind. I take it back. Yeah. It is his fault. <laughs> yeah. Um. I will. I'll say that that's particularly like Southern Jersey and not even Southern Jersey, but more of like the coastal areas in New Jersey have quite a lot of tolls. Um, the Parkway and the Turnpike, really. But yeah, I mean, I have to go through tolls just to get to work in the morning. So it's uh. Yeah, it's it's not very fun. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it was shocking how many there was, and then I started researching it, and it seems like a lot of people are like, "Oh yeah, that's what like New Jersey's known for." So, yeah, great I mean, job, to, New Jersey. Yeah, just to to drive to like New York City from Cape May is about a forty dollar trip in tolls. Ooh, that's yeah. brutal. <laughs> it, it was beautiful. Like the coastal areas of New Jersey were beautiful. And it was funny because we would be like, wow, what a cool stop. And then we'd like Derek would be happy about it. And then we'd be on the road and he'd be like, this is the worst. So he'd go up and be like, what a cool <laughs> lighthouse we saw. Dude, this is the worst date ever. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm glad to hear you say it's beautiful because I think a lot of people have this impression of New Jersey that the entire thing is just a landfill. Um, but we, we've got some nice, some nice areas in New Jersey, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I think Derek mentioned the Barney at Lighthouse. That was a place I thought was really cool. Barney at Lighthouse State Park. And then I have obviously Cape May was really cool too. You know, just anywhere where there's an ocean, you get that cool vibe. And New Jersey does actually have a lot of coastline. We really appreciated all the brands because, yeah. you know, brands pretty yeah. rare for Wisconsin. So them just being everywhere, we were like, oh, it's so cool. Yeah. No, we definitely got a lot of brand here. Um, I think you were probably here just a little bit too late, but. Barnegat is a really great spot for Harlequin duck. Um, we got one. one. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, if you go in, you know, the main winter months, you, there's groups of, you know, 10, 20 there easily. It's it's a great spot. Um, but we do actually have two plover nests there right now. So that's one of the sites I have to go monitor. Um, oh, nice. There's an oyster catcher pair that we saw there as well. Yep, that's actually the one I, I'd been talking about, um, I think, before we started the show but um one of those birds has some fishing line tangled around its oh, legs oh, okay. i don't i didn't yeah. notice any but we weren't looking that hard it's Maybe it's recently. not very noticeable i mean the bird has actually had the the line on its leg for since last year wow um, but you know we just we want to avoid any injuries happening to it but that bird is just you know we use this this sort of setup where when they have the nest um we put up a decoy oyster catcher uh, we play the calls um, and then we have a net that's sort of like when we trigger it, it sort of springs forward and, you know, goes over the, the bird. But for whatever reason, this pair of oyster catchers, they just they see that decoy. They hear the calls right next to their nest and they they don't care. <laughs> they cannot be bothered to defend their nest, um, huh. which is just like. It's really interesting to see the kind of differences in personalities that these birds have, like between the same species, because those birds are so nonchalant. They don't care at all. 
and then we have another bird that if it even if it's sitting on the nest and it sees you it will dive bomb you it will you know do the thing where it's shooting straight at you and then swerve away at the last minute mm. they scream at you you know you can't you can't turn your back on this bird so it's really interesting just like the different kind of parenting or nest you know watching strategies that they have lack of parenting yeah definitely man oyster catchers are so cool though they're one of those birds that I really wanted to see, you know, before I first made a trip out to the East Coast at all. Just so unique looking for a shorebird. Yeah, and they're they're very adaptable too. Like they're they're doing so much better than the plovers in New Jersey because they will nest, you know, anywhere. We have some that nest on the roofs of the like casinos in Atlantic City. <laughs> Um, they'll nest under bridges, you know, they'll, they'll go anywhere. Whereas the plovers are, are typically pretty particular about, about, you know, their habitat requirements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, so, you know, we tend to ask this, but what's the sketchiest experience you've had out there slash, have you seen anything, you know, paranormal or Ghosts, Sasquatchy Sasquatch, or... vampires, chupacabra, demons? Yeah. Um, I would say that there was one time I was birding uh, in North Jersey, where I'm from, um, Morris County, New Jersey. And I was at this um, spot kind of where there was like a little parking lot in the woods to go out to some trails. And I parked and there was like a guy in a white van like, staring at me from the minute I parked. And I thought it was kind of weird. So I got out of my car and I started to walk down the trail and I just had this feeling. So I, I kind of like shimmied behind a tree and peeked back and the guy had like gotten out of his car and was going around just like inspecting my car and staring in all the windows and just like doing loops around it. And I was like a lot younger at the time. I was, I think only like 19 or 20. And um, I got really freaked out and I was like, <laughs> hid behind this like log and just waited and watched until he disappeared and then I still sat there for I didn't do any birding that day <laughs> I was oh, so geez. freaked out um and yeah eventually I just went back and bolted out of there and I never went back to that spot ever again did wow. he drive off eventually or he just like he walked did, yeah I okay I have no clue what, what it because like I mean if he was just trying to like steal things from my car i don't know why he would be staring me down so obviously like when i was still in the parking lot it was a very odd experience um but that was in new jersey and one thing i will say about new jersey birding is that um my sketchiest experiences and the rudest birders i've met have all been in new jersey whereas that's kind of one of the other things i love about vermont is it's like the most tight-knit birding community everyone's always friendly everyone will show you around i my first camera for birding came from a, another birder in vermont that i had only met like three times and then i mentioned i was looking for a camera and he just gave me his backup camera for free wow. <laughs> so well, uh, people that's kind of i guess the other plug i'd put in for vermont is that the birding community is the best of any state i've ever birded in like people are always going to be friendly to you and take you you know help you out with any birds you want to find but yeah new jersey i've ran into people who like straight up to my face have like started ranting about how you know people shouldn't be posting locations for certain birds because then you get random people like you showing up who don't know what they're doing and like okay just like, minding I'm, my I'm in the top 50 in vermont so you yeah know, do you know who i am yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i honestly like there are definitely the birding community in, in new jersey can be a little like i don't know kind of gatekeepy sometimes mm. um compared to vermont and that obviously that's not true for everyone but it's just some experiences i've had i will say i think most of the people we met in vermont were pretty nice you mean like, new jersey um, yeah in new jersey like the well, the gas pumping thing is kind of different because, you know, you're not allowed to pump your own gas. So I was kind of freaked out. I'm like, what do I do? I was like, do I tip them? Like, do I leave my car here? Do they come over? <laughs> that was a little bit of an experience. We met a nice lady uh, who was working there. And then, um, you know, the people at the gas station were nice. Other birders are pretty nice. I was going to say, come to think of it, really, everyone we met was very nice. Yeah, I don't think we met anyone rude. Yeah, no, I mean, people are not at all, like, 
nasty the way that people think you know new jersey people are there's definitely just kind of like a more of a like a bluntness maybe like i don't know how to isn't that kind of like an east coast thing like the east definitely the drivers were blunt and uh very uh liberal with their horn i love the horn honk game it's like, hey, I'm here. Just I'm here. Started doing it whenever. It's like a contact call. We would just start you know, it's doing like, this, I'm like, over here. Open road, you know. Burr, burr, burr. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, growing up in New Jersey, I thought a lot of, I didn't even notice a lot of that stuff. And then when I started leaving for college and different field jobs, I was like, I'm noticing a distinct lack of, you know, crazy driving and urgency and, um, you know, attitude <laughs> and, and it almost feels like home, you know? <laughs> we actually debated why everyone is in such a rush because no one actually can go anywhere. Because it's like, you know, if you're in New York or Hoboken or something, you're trying to drive and you're rushing around, you're going to be sitting there. And I think it's because people have to rush to wait. You know? Like, yeah. if you're going to wait an hour, you want that to start as soon as possible. You don't exactly. want to dilly-dally around and make it an hour and a half. Yeah, you've got it. You, you might as well be from New Jersey. <laughs> never say that to me again but thank you <laughs> though uh no paranormal experiences out there um no no i i yeah i I don't think so no gotcha uh with vermont are you a big noah khan fan i have never heard a noah khan song in really? my life he has a like no, uh no so is a song called Stick Season. Do they call it actually call it Stick Season the Winter? I've never heard that. Okay. I think so Noah Khan's a, a dirty liar. Whoa, I mean, look, look, let's hold take on. it easy. Hey, like, I'm walking here. What are you I, doing? I don't wanna look, I'm not from Vermont, right? So I lived there for four years. I feel like it's home to me now, but I, I'm not from top there. Top hundred Ebert though. I <laughs> not top fifty. I don't. I don't want to catch any heat from anyone who's actually from Vermont. Noah Khan tweets, "Who's this Max Carroll guy? That <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thinks he knows about Vermont." But no, he has like. Uh, yeah, I'm um, assuming. But he no, I don't. There, I have no clue. Yeah, there's a song where he's like, uh, you know, I love Vermont, but it's the season of the six, like referring to winter. Doesn't he so say he's know, mean because he grew up in New England? Yeah, I mean that tracks. Whoa. Whoa. I'm not Max, I mean, but like you know the. The, the mean New Englander thing is definitely more associated with like Massachusetts and Connecticut. Mm, like Boston. Vermonters are the friendliest people you'll ever meet in your life. New Hampshire. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm just, I like to mess around because I just, the way I feel is that Vermont is just a better version of New Hampshire, but um, you know, I don't have anything against New Hampshire really. That's fair. This whole thing's got me excited to go back to New England. Well, yeah, I guess I've been to Boston once, so back to New England is appropriate. We kept trying to figure out if uh, New Jersey was in New England, and then just did a quick Google and found out it is not. It is not part Do of not, New England. Yeah, don't say that to people in New England. They won't <laughs> like it if you include New Jersey. <laughs> it's close, though. It's close They'll in proximity. They'll take their white van, park it next to you, and just leer at you if you say that. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, no, if if you're planning a, a trip to New England at some point, I would I would go during the summer. Um, you know, get get the the boreal species in Vermont. You can get some breeding golden cheeked warblers. You could hop over to Cape Cod and get sheer Not waters. golden cheek, right? Golden winged. Golden winged, yeah. No, golden cheek is, is that'd be in something. Texas. That would hidden, be quite hidden gem of Vermont, the golden cheek. Yeah, that 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 would be something, definitely. But like I said originally, I think we'll have to do an exchange program. You'll have to come here, and we'll have to show you around the Wisconsin stuff, and then you'll have to show us around the New England stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I recall. I don't know what episode it was, but I I heard you guys one time talking about getting um towns and solitaires in Wisconsin. Oh yeah. Yes. And I like had no clue that was a bird that would even remotely occur near wisconsin yes so, if you look at their uh range map they actually have that blue dotted winter line that goes through the midwest and then loops back around so we have a place called devil's lake where they show up pretty much annually as long as the juniper crop is good so oh. if you hike the up devil's lake which is this big bluff uh you can get them there and this year was really good for them so it was like you could not throw a stone there without being in a place to hear or see one so, nice. and, awesome. so we also had a gray crown rosy finch hanging out on devil's lake and a golden eagle 
So it was like a little Western oh, wow. bird haven. Yeah, Western bird paradise. Wisconsin is yeah. full of surprises. I feel like it's a pretty underrated place to place to bird because we got the Kirtland's warblers that breed here. We got a whooping crane population, just all kind. We got boreal birds in the north. We get a lot of the eastern warblers on the coast. So, yeah, I feel like I usually associate the the Kirtland's with with Michigan, but yeah. um, is is it how easy is it to get them in Wisconsin? I mean, I think we've got them every time we've tried for them. It's a little like, you know, they're, uh, you know, protected. So it's not a super like they don't. Yeah. Well, I think they do do tours in there, don't they? They used to. I don't know if they still do. They used to do like yeah. some paid DNR tours. But yeah, I think every time we've gone for them, we've seen them. Nice. Well, cool. Thanks so much for joining us, Max. It was great talking with you. Did you have anything else you wanted to add about? Uh, the Northeast or field work or Sasquatches or anything like that? Yeah, I would just say um, I would, if you want to give Vermont birding a try, like you got to, the way to get into it is to just like prepare yourself for the fact that a lot of birds that you might be used to seeing as common are going to be really exciting birds for Vermont. And I think if you can like put yourself into like the mindset of a Vermont birder and, you know, get really excited for that, you know, for that wimbrel or that American golden plover that shows up on the lake, then you're going to have a great time birding in Vermont. Um, or you could just go for the boreal species and leave like most people do. <laughs> but um, either way, I, I can't recommend it enough. And I, I don't think enough people talk about it. Yeah. I feel like you've sold me on it. I'm great. I want to well, go and, you know, feed the red breasted nut hatches and look at the grouse and, Ironclad guarantee that you see this. That's true. Films. Yeah. If if you guys go and you don't see it, um, which you will, but if <laughs> you could uh you could, you know, shoot me an email and say you need to come back on the, the podcast and defend yourself, you know. You can just berate me for, for an hour for we just literally do the worst job of looking ever. We just like pop out of the car, we're like, Well, not here. Max is a yeah. liar. <laughs> <laughs> To be to be to be clarify, I did say if if you spend the full day there, you did say the that it'll you be a video that. that's like we spent twenty four okay, well, hours and and didn't see a bird that was guaranteed <laughs> because we literally just wore blindfolds or stayed in the car the whole time. Oof, There's yeah. ways um, around the rule. So Max is like so north of you know Central Park, like New York. Is that part of New England more chill like less tolls um people aren't as crazy drivers because we kind of had this theory that like that new york new jersey area was a little more crazy with like traffic and everything does it get better if you go up by vermont and then east? oh oh yeah um, okay i mean massachusetts is insane um but vermont yeah i mean vermont has more dirt roads like per capita than any other state like the it's very few cars on the road there's barely even major highways it's it's a very relaxing state to drive in very few tolls yeah you, you don't have to worry about that at all cool that sounds good to me i'm down for yeah. less tolls any day yeah all right well thanks so much for joining us max is there a place people can uh you know check out your pictures or you know see what you're working on or anything like that are you a social media website guy yeah, um, I mean, I'm I'm not much of a photographer, but if I see some cool things, I'll post them on my Instagram. It's uh, Max dot Manhattan. Um, that would be where you could find me. Yeah. Max Manhattan. We gotta follow the peg leg oyster catcher. That's I think true. That that's we need be a fan we favorite. need daily updates on. Yeah, on you know, I'll have to bring my uh, I'll bring my camera out to the site next time and get try to snag snag a picture of him. He's he's a real charismatic bird. Perfect. We await the name decision. Yeah. All right, well, thanks so much, Max, and thanks to everyone for watching this episode of the Badgerland Birding Podcast. Mm -hmm.